So very a very good afternoon to all. It's indeed a pleasure speaking on this STM platform to uh, such a huge group of participants here. I hope I address the expert instance of the participants here. So I quickly, it's a one hour uh, session. I will pick, it's a huge topic. I will quickly start, start with my presentation here. So I'll, I'll be speaking on the, how to interpret the appearance, the microscopy, the culture and sensitivity, the antigen detection or the molecular detection, the toxin detection and a uh, few liners on biomarkers. So, so when we, uh, it's about when we get microbiology is uh, from the basis for running the antimicrobial stewardship program. They, they are the basis for, for the hospital to prepare the antibiogram. So it's, it's, it's the microbiology reports play a very key role uh, in a patient uh, care. So let us in the micro in micro when microbiology reports are dispatched and we get in hand, we see the uh, it's, it's, it's unlike the radiology or the pathology reports. It is uh, multiple parameters are there in microbiology reports, and each needs to be uh, interpreted uh, cautiously to understand uh, the line of treatment for the patient. To start with the first thing that we get to uh, we get in and uh, we get to see is about the appearance. Regarding the appearance, the appearance could be purulent or blood stained or turbid or clear. So uh, from the microbiology report, the first thing we have to uh, do is to whether to see whether there is a true infection or there is an inflammation or a, or colonization or a contamination. So how to how to know whether there is a true infection? So we have, we have to see from the appearance is there is an evidence of inflammation or disease. That is whether the sample is purulent or pus, pus or liquid store, which indicates infection. If there is, is there any evidence of any contact with a non-sterile site or absence of disease like salivary sputum or epithelial cells in urine or a formed stool, this uh, it is not significant and indi indicates either colonization or contamination. So let us see in detail in next slides how to differentiate between infection, contamination, and colonization. A list of different appearances of, of the organisms are also mentioned in the microbiology report. For example, the reports that states say gram positive coca in chains on the gram film. Now to, let's understand how is it is it consistent with the diagnosis. If the patients, uh, if the patient has signs and symptoms of respiratory tract infections like cough, breathlessness, and fever, and the possible pro probable uh, suspected diagnosis is pneumonia, so then it is in parallel with our microscopy report that gram positive cocaine chains because gram positive cocaine chains means it's a streptococcus, it indicates streptococcus species. So our diagnosis of pneumonia is in correlation with the microscopy finding. Let us see for a few more uh, how a uh, few more such uh, similar comments in the microscopy. If no, say example for example sputum sample, if no pus cells are seen in the gram stain, then it rules out the diagnosis of pneumonia. So no need to culture specimen. In such case, if you uh, I repeat again, if there is no pus cells or the pus cells are not significant, when we say pus cells are significant, when it is more than twenty five per field, and if it is less than nine per field, it is of no, it is it is it doesn't indicate any infection. So in such cases, from the microscopy itself, we can avoid the unnecessary sputum culture if sputum return has been done. So if the gram stain is of a high quality, only when there are less than 10 epithelial cells per field or more than 25 neutrophils or per cells per field. And there's a single dominant bacterial morphology, which is suggestive of infection. It's called as a rule of three. When three or more than three organisms are uh, mentioned, or morphology is mentioned in the microscopy, it indicates colonization of contamination. Similarly, in the culture, three organisms indicates colonization or contamination. So only a, a dominant, a single dominant of bacterial morphology or maximum two is indicative of infection. If the gram stain shows different organisms, it is non-specific and cannot be relied. If there are more than 10 epithelial cells per low power field and multiple bacterial types on microscopy, it indicates for the sputum sample, it indicates contamination with oral microflora. So that was what, what is also called as a Barlett's criteria that, that is less than 10 epithelial cells or more than 25 per cells are only significant for sputum. Similarly, for urine, the absence of pyruria largely excludes UTI. 
a good tool uh, this absence presence or absence of para is a good tool to reduce unnecessarily urine cultures from the urine microscopy itself we can we can uh, we can uh, uh, decide whether to go for culture or not that is what is called a diagnostic step step to have rational utilization of whatever the preliminary reports we had and do the testings rationally now in the urine presence of pus that is more than 10 wbcs is suggestive of bacteria and is warrants antibiotic administration that too only in symptomatic patients as pyuria can occur in the absence of apparent infection like patient who has taken antimicrobials or contamination of by vaginal secretions or colonization or enduring catheters or asymptomatic bacteria or in case of atypical organisms such as chlamydia uropasma and tuberculosis there in uh, it's possible so let us understand few more microscopy terms such as uh, gram positive cocaine clusters it indicates staphylococcus species gram positive cocaine chains streptococcus or enterococcus gram positive coco bacilli it indicates hemophilus so from the microscopy report itself if the if the culture identification is still awaited from the microscopy uh, ob observation only we uh, result only we can uh, it will indicate we will get to know and a pro probable idea of which organism it would be so lactose fermenting gram negative rods is uh, uh, reported it indicates enterobacteria like e coli klebsiella if lactose negative gram negative rods uh, it indicates pseudomonas gram uh, lactose positive it indicates enterobacteria branching gram positive rods it indicates nocardia streptomyces species acid fast bacilli is common it indicates mycobacterium tuberculosis budding is cells canada now again from the canada when it is reported if you do germ tube test and this positive it indicates canada albicans which is a pathogenic germ tube negative it is indicates non albic albicans uh, canada no canada non albicans which which are most of the canada non albicans are non pathogenic unless opportunistic uh, in conditions they are uh, opportunistic pathogen round is cells it mentioned in the microscopy this is a streptococcus species so from the list of the organisms which have grown is does it is, we have to see whether it is consistent with diagnosis streptococcus pneumonia is cultured from a patient with pneumonia then see the microscopy pattern and from that we will get to know which antibody can be used for the empirical therapy or to escalate to deescalate the empirical therapy how to differentiate the infection uh, colonization or contamination that's the main thing that first needs to be done from the microscopy report isolation of enterococcus fecal is from urine now also it is necessary to understand the habitat of the organisms each of the organisms this is what the in, uh, infection control officer or the, the team also does they first understand the habitat of the organism to understand whether it's a true infection and what might be the root cause of the transmission of the infection for example isolation of enterococcus fecal is from urine is important from symptomatic patient but it will be of no relevance if isolated from sputum similarly canara species are rarely pathogenic in urine cultures or respiratory cultures group b beta hemolytic streptococci does not cause uti it represents colonization from vaginal tract so it's it, that it should want to say that explain that the habitat of the organisms is very important to interpret the report streptococcus pneumonia doesn't cause infection of pharynx but if it is isolated from throat swab it suggests colonization E. coli from an ulcer on leg is a colonizer, but as it does not have the potential to cause infection, sir. So, as I rightly said by Claude Bernard, that germ is not important. It is a terrain on which it is found that is important. Then, how to uh, interpret this uh, uh, numbers, quantitative values of the culture report? Rare, few, moderate, as is reported in some cultures. The interpretation depends upon the source source of the culture, the gram strength results. Like uh, when when report says rare gram negative or Does not mean that is unusual, but it says that it has presented low numbers. So I said that habitat is important. It's necessary to understand the sterile sites and the non-sterile sites. Sterile sites normally do not contain any bacteria. For example, uh, blood, CSF, bile, fluid, and other fluids. Non-sterile sites they are open to external environment and they include coarse swabs, clean swabs, and other uh, swabs and many others. As said, that habit understand the habitat from blood from blood any organism will be pathogenic. Uh, same for tissues and from from the genital. Uh, Nasira gonorrhea is a bit of metastatic streptococci. Listeria monocytes are 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 the colonizers. So and uh, so the examples of different colonizers from different uh, areas of the body like gastrointestinal tract or respiratory tract. It's necessary to understand this uh, habitat when when interpreting the reports. The most important test is blood cultures. That's it is 
it is imperative to under, uh, to understand that uh, not all organisms are facult are strictly aerobes nor all organisms are strictly anaerobes a large number of organisms or pathogens say 80 to 90 percent nearly facultative to anaerobes like staphylococcus streptococcus e coli clepsila so when we correct a blood culture it is necessary to do both aerobic as well as anaerobic in fact in, in from, from my observation it was observed that uh, anaerobic bottles flags early than the aerobic bottles They said to uh, pair up aerobic and anaerobic bottles from each hand, say left hand and right hand. So uh, from each bottle, at least 8 to 10 ml of blood should be collected. So in total, it is about 40 ml of blood that should be collected from an adult patient. From periodic patients, depending upon the weight, the blood volume should be collected. So the advantage of anaerobic bottle, it, it increases the yield. An advantage of increased four bottles, it, it, again, it increases the yield. Also, not all, not at all time, the sepsis is continuous. Sepsis can be intermittent or transient too. Hence, the necessity of four blood, four blood culture bottles at an interval of uh, two, uh, the pair each at an interval of one, an hour or 30 minutes. Now, how to, uh, the interpretation of the blood cultures? Any recognized pathogen from any of the bottle is significant. Unless if it is a low virulence skin organism like Coagulus negative staphylococcus species, then it needs to be isolated from all, both the bottles or all the four bottles. If it is isolated from only one of the bottles, then it indicates contamination. I repeat again, some low virulence organisms or some opportunity like pathogens like Coagulus negative staphylococcus or cornipectum or other such contaminants. If they are isolated from only one of the bottles, it indicates contamination or colonization. But it is isolated from all the bottles or two of the bottles that indicates infection. So we have various bottle, bottle we have various machines also. We have, some are fluorescence based, uh, some are fluorescence based, some are color based. Uh, the blood cultures, the bottles, needs, it's also very uh, important to understand the uh, uh, correct temperature required for the storage, collection, storage, and transport. The blood culture bottles should be stored at room temperature, like CSF samples should, should be stored at room, te room temperature, uh, while other microbiology samples should be refrigerated at 220 degrees Celsius. And now, how, how to interpret the blood cultures from central line? Central line cultures turn positive more than two hours early than the peripheral cultures, then it is central line associated infections. If it is a, if for central line infections, now it's most of the time we see that the tips are given, but tips are not uh, recommended for diagnosing, uh, detecting catheter associated blood stem infection. Central line and peripheral should be collected at two, uh, two hours apart. Uh, so, uh, uh, central line peripheral should be collected. And if, if the central line turns positive to more than two hours early than the peripheral culture, it is central line associated infection. Peripheral and central line cultures all turn positive within two hours. It may be bacteria from another source. Central line culture turns positive, but the peripheral cultures are negative. Contamination or early colonization is in is, uh, is the cause. Similarly, for urine cultures, in symptomatic patients, only the urine cultures are significant. That to only one bacterial species with a colony count of more than 10 to 5. If two organisms or two types of organisms, but uh, then one predominant growth of one organism should be more than 10 to 5. If more than two organisms, then it's a contaminant as said earlier. Do not treat as sym asymptomatic except in case of pregnancy or urological procedures. And don't treat contaminants from urine cultures. It's usually seen that urine cultures are, are, are investigated randomly, but it should be tested only for symptomatic patients unless pregnancy or urological procedures. Counts less than 10 to 5 each considered significant for catheterized urine specimen for acute urethral syndrome or patients who are on antibiotics, urine tract obstruction, pyelonephritis, or specimens collected by suprapubic aspirations.
So that was about the urine cultures. Let's say about the respiratory culture. Here in quantity to count, that colony count is very important. Negative culture, we say when there is no growth of any pathogens and it roots out pneumonia, unless antibiotics were initiated before cultures were obtained. But positive cultures from the tracheal aspirate alone does not prove the presence of pneumonia. Here even, uh, they may result from colonization also. So, so here in the quantity count is important. Uh, certain species may be more likely to represent colonization like enterobacter, protease, cetrobacter, and others. I missed this slide here, but here in the quantity count for ET secretions is about 10 to 6 colonies per, per ml, or for bulk sample, it is 10 to 4. Uh, and for uh, uh, plural fluid, it, even a single, in, single colony count is significant. So that was about the colony counts, uh, uh, importance of respiratory cultures and urine cultures. And we have seen the, about the appearance of the uh, samples, uh, importance of the appearance of the samples. Now let us see how to interpret this susceptibility testing. Now, why we do susceptibility testing, which is to select from the antibiotic report. So from the susceptibility antibiotic report, we get to know which antibiotic uh, that we can uh, uh, start or the start on. If empirical therapy is given, we can escalate or de-escalate based on the antimicrobial susceptibility report. Then it helps us to monitor the resistance development, whether there is ESB or I'm saying other such resistance mechanism. It helps you to detect new resistance mechanism. It helps to compare the resistance patterns among different geographical areas, among different healthcare hospitals, hospitals. And it helps us to evaluate the impact of our infection control and antimicrobial stewardship program. As I uh, uh, mentioned in this before, that importance of appropriate sampling and collection and storage. Uh, to repeat again, I will come back to blood again. It should be it should not be refrigerated. Both bottles, aerobic and anaerobic bottles, each from uh, left and right hand should be collected to increase the yield and to maximize the uh, yield of aerobic and anaerobic organisms. So, and the samples should reach within two hours of collection. Similarly, for CSF, wherein fastidious organisms like Streptococcus pneumonia, hemophilus, or Nigeria meningitis is suspected, the CSF samples should, should, be, uh, should reach the laboratory within two to four hours of collection. And the CSF samples should be Kept, uh, should be inoculated into the uh, lab at 30 and uh, in a 5 percent carbon dioxide atmosphere because carbon dioxide, some most of the these facetious organisms are capnophilic, they require carbon dioxide for the growth. Hence, the CSF sample needs to be incubated into a carbon dioxide incubator or five incubator with 5 percent carbon dioxide atmosphere. If such incubator or uh, such fluid bottles for CSF are not available. Usually it is seen that CSF is sent in a sterile container. But CSF needs to be sent in an enriched or enrichment medium. Uh, usually uh, at some uh, resources uh, where research is available, it is collected in the fluid bottle. But when not, it can be, uh, since it is, a, it is a very precious, delicate sample and fastidious organisms are suspected, the CSF sample can be directly inoculated into pre-warmed chocolate agar plates. To maximize the yield. So that was about the blood and the CSF sample. Now let's see about sensitivity testing. Sensitivity testing can be either phenotypic or genotypic. Phenotypic testings are universally applicable, mechanism independent. So uh, it, it is related, it, is, it has a therapeutic relevance. However, the issue with the therapy, uh, phenotypic testing is that it requires time for the colonies to grow. It, all, it is all colony dependent and it is all expression dependent. The resistance will be detected only if the gene is expressed. While well, genotypic is very rapid, it gives the confirmed the resistance mechanism, but it is limited to only few resistance genes and antibiotics. So that was the limitation of genotypic. So I'll be uh, speaking about only of phenotypic sessions here. Uh, under uh, phenotypic, there are various phenotypic methods uh, available, and depends upon which uh, phenotypic testing methods to use depends upon the uh, factors like reproducibility, reliability, accuracy, flexibility, and adaptability in others. But only few phenotypic methods like disk diffusion or broad dilution or e-test has been proved successful for, uh, uh, for results. So this phenotypic AST testing uses qualitative results such as resistance, intermediate, or sensitive. It's also to quantitative results in terms of MIC, that is minimum inhibitor concentration. So minimum inhibitor concentration, we'll speak in details in the next slides. It is the minimum concentration of the antibiotics that inhibits the bacterial growth. Well, resistance means treatment failure is expected. Intermediate means treatment is possible at high doses. Sensitive means successful treatment is possible at the doses recommended.
So we'll just we'll give a, we'll we'll speak we'll uh, speak in a short about the phenotypic testing method how it is done. In Kirby Bauer method, it's a disc diffusion method. Antibiotic uh, discs uh, are inoculated onto the culture plate, wherein already we had the bacterial suspension grown. And after the overnight incubation, we observed the clear zones around the antibiotic disc, which indicates the sensitivity. And depending upon the diameter of the sensitivity or clear zone, we interpret it as clear, a sensitivity intermediate resistance in accordance with the breakpoints. Now, what is breakpoints? We'll see in the next slides. So that was about this diffusion method. Actually, actually, this diffusion is not recommended. The current the gold standard is the broad dilution. And from the broad dilution, we get to know MIC method. So how this broad dilution is done? Broad dilution is done in, a, in, a, in an LS, we get an LSA plate wherein we have the uh, antibodies impregnated in increasing concentration. Over that, we inoculate bacterial suspensions, uniform bacterial suspension, and the next day, we have, after incubation, we observe the clear zone. The clear zone is taken as the MIC, that is minimum inhibitory concentration. So, for example, here is the clear zone. The MIC is one. So, based uh, based on the MIC and the minimum bacterial concentration, one of minimum bacterial concentration. Here, I had whales. If I, if I had got uh, plates like agar plates, and on the clear, if the plates would have been clear, it it, it is called it is called, it is called a min, minimum bacterial concentration. So, M it called MBC. So the ratio of MBC to MIC, if it is less than four, it is bactericidal. If it is more than four, it is bacterostatic. So that just helps us to know whether the antibiotic is bactericidal or bacterostatic. Where the facilities are not available for uh, this broad dilution, or uh, uh, where where it is possible to do uh, need, uh, to e test where e MIC is needed, therein we can do e testing that absolute testing. Wherein this is an antibiotic impregnated uh, strip and it is inoculated over the bacterial suspension, and then the, at the point where the clear zone is interpreted is taken as the MIC. Then we have automated methods of machines like uh, Vitek and Phoenix, wherein we also, we get the not only the or, MIC of the uh, uh, antibiotics against the organism, but we also get the identification of the bacteria or the fungi. Also, if they are uh, installed with some softwares like Epicenter or Myla, we get the real-time antibiogram also, which helps the clinicians a lot as per from my experience. It helps them to get the real-time antibiogram or, organism-wise, sample-wise, and department-wise. So that was about the various the different methods of doing the sensitive testings. Uh, we, have, we have seen this diffusion, we have seen the broad dilution, we have seen the heat test and automatic method. But the gold standard is uh, MIC, that is a broad dilution. For some antibodies like cholestine and others, they are heavy molecules. So this diffusion gives a false results. So hence, here in such cases, broad dilution or MIC is, is recommended. So that uh, now how we get now that was till the how to uh, how we get the reports uh, sensitivity reports now how to interpret these reports the dilemma is that will the physician understand how will he modify this antibiotics based on the results will the physician act promptly now how to interpret these results that there should be actually uh, the principle or uh, the, the thing that could help the clinician in interpreting will be the role of clinical microbiologist in diagnostic stewardship or diagnostic stewardship is the right test for the right patient while antimicrobial stewardship is the right interpretation of of the report for the right antimicrobial at the right time. So this is a diagnosis stewardship and antimicrobial stewardship are interrelated. It is very imperative to, un, to have a close link or inter, inter, a rapport between the healthcare providers and the microbiology laboratory and the patients. Coming back to how to interpret the microbiology reports, uh, uh, is that it is called, the main concept is the clinical categorization. When we get the MICs from the different methods, like say broad dilution and the automated method, it is co it is interpreted as resistant, intermediate, or sensitive in correlation with the breakpoints. If the MIC is more than the breakpoint, it is interpreted as resistant. If it is less than the breakpoint, it is interpreted as susceptible. If it is in between, it is interpreted as intermediate. Now, let's see what to, what is breakpoint. Breakpoints now, when we get the microbiology report, usually we get the in one column is the antibodies, another column is the sensitive intermediate, uh, third column is the MICs. 
but you should uh, the clinic the healthcare provider should also uh, parallel you should ask for the breakpoint or the microbiologist should provide the breakpoints or the breakpoints should be there in the clinical setting to understand how to interpret the MICs. The breakpoints are obtained from uh, organizations like FDA, CLSR, UCAS. The breakpoints are achieved from serum achievable levels for each antibiotic, de depends on the particular resistance mechanism and successful therapeutic outcome. The breakpoints are given by CLSI, that is Clinical and Laboratory Standard Institute. Usually, CLSI is mostly followed in most of the settings. Uh, the breakpoints are also given by UCAST. UCAST, uh, the breakpoints are available free on the on their portals, where CLSI has to be purchased. UCAST is renewed, uh, the guidelines are, are renewed at, uh, every five years or, or earlier. But CLS takes about two years. If we refer to the CLS document, there, there, are, there are many uh, reference materials for how to do uh, the quality control or how to interpret the sensitization. We can refer for the same, similarly for UCAST. Now coming back to again to breakpoints, breakpoints are obtained from uh, three steps. One is microbiological, that is getting epidermal cutoff. Second is pharmacology, that is applying PKPD indices to the cutoffs. And third is the clinical correlation. So from these three steps, we get to know the breakpoints. So we have seen sensitive intermediate resistance. The other terminology used in CLSI recently is susceptible dose dependent, and in UCAS is susceptible increase exposure. Increase exposure. They are similar to the intermediate definition, but in, but they have been proven by strong experimental studies that higher doses is required to ensure efficacy. Antibodies may be efficacious if concentrated in vivo in an infective fluid. So this is how the CLSI uh, chart looks like, for example, for enterobacteria uh, for different antibiotics. Say, for example, if I get an E. coli and, uh, and, the, and I get the MIC as one, so I will refer to this chart. We'll see the sensitive breakpoint is two. My MIC is one, so it is lesser than the breakpoint, so that the MIC of one will be interpreted as sensitive. If it would have, if the MIC would have been 16, since it was greater than the resistant breakpoint, the MIC would have been interpreted, interpreted as resistant. So this is how the MIC is interpreted as sensitive or resistance based on the breakpoints. So, uh, uh, but uh, the breakpoints also differs for organism to organism from sample to samples. Uh, for example, streptococcus pneumonia would have been a sample. Uh, the streptococcus pneumonia has different breakpoints for CSO sample and non CSO sample. So when we get you get the report, see that uh, you see that the strepto the breakpoints are applied according to the samples. So it happens that in set some settings it was observed recently that. A series of sample, the, the non meningitis uh, breakpoints were applied. So that error should, should be avoided from the lab settings and the clinicians should be aware of such breakpoints. This was, this was the example that was, I was speaking about the penicillin, uh, uh, the breakpoints are different for meningitis and non meningitis sample. There is a term called as efficacy ratio, or a better term will be breakpoint to MIC. The ratio of the susceptible breakpoint to MIC, which is called as efficacy ratio, this gradient or this quotient, if it is more than two, then the antibiotics is preferred for treatment. Uh, usually in my report, I give this, this ratio. This ratio is also at, in some settings mis uh, mis uh, uh, written as a uh, this thera thera therapeutic index, which is like a misnomer. So the correct term will be breakpoint to MIC quotient. So it is it is all dependent on the breakpoints, but when we don't have breakpoints in hand, then we refer to the epidemiological cutoff value or ECV or ECOV. This uh, this uh, ECV or ECOV, they, they they are like when they should be used only when the breakpoints are not available. Breakpoints help us to know whether the whether there is sensitive intermediate resistance, but ECOV help us to understand only if there is a resistance mechanism present or absent. If the resistance mechanism present, we call the MIC as non-wild type. If the resistance mechanism is absent, we call the MIC as wild type. So if you have various MICs, and then the ECOF will divide that MIC into wild type or non-wild type. Wild type means no resistance mechanism. Non-wild type means resistance mechanism. Let me explain with an example. 
for example, meropenem, MI, uh, the, MI, the breakpoint by CLS is 1, breakpoint by UCAS is 2, but the ECOF where cutoff is 0.125. So anything lesser than this, if the breakpoint should not been, have been uh, with me, I would, I would interpret this MIC as non-wild type, and any MIC greater than this would as a, uh, I'm sorry, any MIC is lesser than this e -cough as wild type, any MIC is greater than this will as a non-wild type. So any MIC is lesser than the e -cough will be a wild type, there is no resistance mechanism. MIC is greater will be a non-wild type with resistance mechanism. So e -cough help us to understand only whether there is a mechanism, resistance mechanism present or absent. Yes, <laughs> For example, say, 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 Solomon or Signala, I don't have azithromycin. So I will refer to the ECOF. ECOF uh, wild type cutoff is 8, non wild type is 16. If my MIC for azithromycin would have been 4, it will be wild type. That is non resistance, uh, no resistance mechanism. If the MIC would have been 32, it is a non wild type with resistance mechanism. So ECOF helps to understand only whether there is a resistance mechanism, yes or no. This is another example uh, of Canada where uh, ECOF uh, was one, MS is two. So MS is so more than uh, ECOF, it is a non wild type with resistance mechanism. Now, again, the clinic, uh, whether to, uh, if the agent is in question to, for treatment, the patient should undergo clinical review. And in consultation with the ID physician only, the decision should be made to continue the uh, antifungal. So to repeat again, ECOF should be used only when the break, uh, when when we should not be used when break once have been published. It's a, just a resistance mechanism indicator. So culture and sensitive reports only tells us about the identification of the bacteria or fungi and the sensitive result. It doesn't tell us about infection, colonization, contamination. That needs to be interpreted. I understand that associated testing is an in vitro phenomena. There could there could be uh, issues because of the in vivo efficacy. The sensitive testing also depends upon variabilities such as the media used in the laboratory, the conditions followed in the laboratory, like uh, incubation and other such things. Then critical errors. The, the, this is for the my uh, laboratory. The, the critical alerts such as any pathogen identified from any uh, precious samples like CS of blood should be immediately informed to the clinician for the uh, immediate empirical therapy uh, and the may, may necessary measures. Any resistance mechanism identified, say like MRSA, ESBL, VRE, should be immediately informed to the clinical team for the immediate isolation precautions to prevent the uh, spread of antimicrobial resistance. So in the microbiology report, the microbiology doesn't report each of the antibodies. Often it is asked for a clinician whether the, the antibodies are missing. It is only the antibodies which is representative of that class is reported in the microbiology report. For example, erythromycin. We don't report azithromycin or erythromycin because erythromycin predicts susceptibility of azithro and calarito. Another thing, oxacillin. If oxacillin is resistance, it indicates the resistance to all the beta lactam group of antibodies like penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenins, and monobactams. So that's so uh, necessary to understand uh, how to microbiologists can put in the interpretation notes about the representative antibiotic. Also necessary to understand that so, uh, some organisms are uh, intrinsically or naturally resistant against antibiotics like enterococcus species. They are intrinsically resi resistant against amyloglycosides, cephalosporins, which is the most commonly prescribed empirical antibiotics. That was about how to interpret the sensitive reports along with breakpoints and efficacy ratio. The another thing is the PKPD indices. There are anti I said before the and and some antibodies are time dependent antibodies where the more the long more the frequency of the administered antibodies for more longer the duration more frequently or extended infusion uh, the, the, more the efficacy. Some like beta lactam antibodies or some are constant dependent antibodies like aminoglycosides. Once a daily dosing is required because they have a long post-antibiotic effect. Uh, some antibodies like quinolones are AUC by MIC. The, 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 the more the law is a, is a mix of both the concentration and the time dependence and like quinolones. So PKPD indices needs to be considered by selected antibiotic from the microbiology report. Some antibodies are hydrophilic antibiotics. 
which which are which are have altered pk that connects in the critically that is they, they they their volume of distribution increases or uh, and decreases in interstitial penetration increases or decreases depending upon the renal function some are lipophilic antibodies so that the peak pharma context needs to be considered while selecting the antibiotic from the microbiology reports what not to give for example in blood pediatric now the microbiologists also should avoid refraining from report, reporting such antibodies for example in blood pediatricycline from say save the first and second generation cephal scoring abscesses amylobacter and daptomycin in lungs because they are not uh, uh, effective in from at this site then understand the bioavailability that more the, the linozolide 100% bioavailability, bioavailability and lindamycin anti so the 100% bioavailability doesn't imply 100% serum concentration pkpd needs to be considered Cons now other thing is uh, we have we have seen the constant uh, we have seen the mics and the, uh, the other term is uh, MPC or mutant prevention co concentration or uh, in index or uh, mutant installation window. Uh, about the MIC, the, the, the four times if they, if they, if they, if they concentrate the antibiotic in the serum, if it is four times the MIC, that the mutant installation window is uh, prevented. So there is no chances of any mutants arising if the um, bacterial concentration is more than the uh, MICs. So the won't go into details of PKPD. We'll uh, come back and we'll limit to the uh, how to interpret the sensitive report. Let us see uh, some uh, few examples of how to interpret the sensitive report. Take an example: like a patient comes to the uh, with a uh, with a complaint of fever, cough, uh, coughing on antibiotic on covamixiclo. His administ his ET secretions are collected and sent for uh, culture. It is Klebsiella. Uh, again, uh, the sensitive pattern was such that. Polystin was uh, intermediate, septic ibitum was sensitive to. Now, uh, now, just a simple example, the cholestin seeing that uh, it is secretions, lung, lung involved, since cholestin will not penetrate into the lung parenchyma, uh, cholestin has nephrotoxicity and other such issues, it doesn't have universal dosage volume. So, the drug of choice will be the septic ibitum. So, I wanted to say that speaker period needs to be considered when we move, when we select the antibiotic. We'll just explain in detail with a few, few more examples in the next slide. We, when which antibiotics we will select from this case study, there are many antibiotics which are sensitive to. So let's understand few rules or for some, some guidelines that I will uh, share here. Always start with, uh, number one is always start with the beta lactam antibiotic because they have they have the best data supporting their use, except in case of atypical infections. Rule number two, do not compare the MSCs. As I said before, each antibiotics has its own breakpoints different uh, temper time activity the pharmacodynamic parameters like time dependent concentration dependent so each antibody different serum to uh, concentration tissue concentration so do not compare the mics the first was select a beta lactam antibiotic second was do not compare the mics third is if it is sensitive to you can use the drug except if the drug doesn't get to the site of action drug doesn't achieve pharmacodynamic parameters but there are patient specific factors there are cost factors where the drug has inducible resistance then avoid it Rule number four, microbiology always has more information. So if the clinician thinks that he can get test for some additional antibiotics, he can get an idea of the resistance mechanism, he the, 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 should link up with the microbiology lab. Now take another example, blood culture, enterococcus, all the antibiotics are sensitive to like MP, Depto, Penicillin, and Co. Which antibiotic will we start with? Let's see, take the uh, rules. <clears throat> the drug choices will be ampicillin, because it will it will not only be uh, proper if uh, that person would be proper than ampicillin because MIC is lower. Ampicillin will be drug of choice. But since coming to rule number four, microbes has more information. You can take for linear linear also taste for linear which is the oral option. But still, ampicillin will be drug of choice as per rule four that cost effectiveness. Take another example: urine culture, ESBL producing Klebsiella isolated. Now. Here in C418, meropenem is sensitive, leoflox is sensitive, TJ cyclin is sensitive, nitrofrotan is sensitive. Now, which antibiotics will you use? Always, always has more, always need to take some more information like cystitis or polynephritis. If cystitis is male, male or female, this assume this is a cystitis in a young female with no comorbidity. Then also check whether IV is needed or oral is needed. Then proceed for the drug selection. Now, coming to back to the selection of the drug, drugs. Now, C4 detain and meropenem were sensitive, but it, since it's an ESBL producer, ESBL means all the cephalosporins will be resistant. So, C4 detain and meropenem will be avoided. Meropenem will, will be avoided because it's an IV. We have oral options like ciprox, leoflox also, but ciprox is re resistant. Hence, leoflox will be avoided because of cross resin issue. 
TJ second again essentially do, but there's poor urine concentration. Hence, our drug of choice will be nitrofurantan, which is the oral option. But again, rule number four, microbiology has more information. They can check for phosphomycin also, but uh, but it is expensive. So we limit ourselves to nitrofurantan as our drug se selection. Now, this is an interesting ca case. Uh, uh, let's say a smoker with fever and cough for one week. I request all to please pay attention to this interesting case. A smoker with a fever and cough for one week on examination, high temperature, decreased air entry, no recent travel, no pets. Now, what will be the investigation that you will do? The investigation that will be done from these four choices will be CBC, CRP, kidney function test, urine dipsticks, and chest X-ray. Why? The CBC and differential will give us information of the likelihood of the infection. Platelets are acute phase reactant, goes up in infection and inflammation. Urea and electrolytes will, uh, will help us to assess the severity of community acquired pneumonia. CRP will rise in bacterial infection. Urine dipstick will help us to, uh, it's like an, it has a negative predictive value of UTI. Chest x is a part of thoracic society criteria. Hence, the, the CBC, urea and electrolytes, CRP, dipstick and chest x was selected. Now we did this test and the, uh, the results were as follows. High WBC, high CRP, creatinine, uh, dipstick was positive for leukocyte, nitrites, chest x was consolidation. Now, what is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is Community acquired pneumonia. WBC CRP suggested acute in bacterial infection. Even though the urine is considered with diagnosis of UTI, the positive predictive value of this dipstick is very low. Uh, it's not doesn't diagnose any UTI. It is approximately 60%. So chest X-ray should consolidation. Hence the diagnosis of community acquired pneumonia. Dual pathology is very rare, and so it is unlikely for the patient to have both community acquired pneumonia and UTI. Hence the diagnosis of community acquired pneumonia. Now based on chest X-ray experience. It, uh, uh, which of the following of the four is not a sign of community acquired pneumonia? The answer is crackles in the chest. The clinical findings were consistent with consultation. So there will be decreased chest movement, decreased expansion, uh, tactile or vocal resonance, dullness, increased breath sound. So crackles are signs of heart failure or fibrosis rather than consultation. Then we did sputum culture, blood culture, and urine for legionella antigen. And what is the, which of these uh, appearance is considered with diagnosis of pneumonia? The answer is purulent. As we have seen in the, the very first slide, the appearance of sputum, sputum helps in distinguishing infection from contamination. Salivary is a risk of contamination. Mucoid means a upper respiratory specimen. But since it was uh, purulent, so it indicated inflammation. Hence, it was uh, it's consistent with this sample of the chest. Hence, the answer is purulent. Now, the patient deteriorated. Uh, oxygen saturation de decreased. Temperature increased. Patient started rigors. Now, which antibodies will start him on? Come to acquired pneumonia. The answer will be Comex Clo plus Clarithromycin. Most hospitals use a combination of beta lactam and a macrolide for severe cap. Peptide is unnecessarily broad spectrum. Gentamicin doesn't penetrate, while clint uh, clintamicin often considered with macrolides because it is a usually lincomacide. It has no activity against non culturable. Ticoplan and Leoflox are often used for severe cap. Uh, however, the patient, uh, but with, for who are allergic beta lactam. But the patient didn't have any evidence of that. Hence, the choice is COMEX uh, clarithromycin. The patient was started COMEX clarithromycin, CURB 65 score was 4. Now, which of the following is the cause of community acquired pneumonia? It's not the cause of community acquired pneumonia, it is pseudomonas erogenesa. It is often the causes of community acquired pneumonia are STAP, streptohemophilus, and others. 
Shurmanas is the mostly hospital acquired. Now the blood investigation revealed that it further deteriorated high WBC, high CRP, creatinine. Blood culture was positive for gram positive cocaine. Urine had no growth. Now, how will you manage the patient now? Persist with coamice clo and clarithromycin because there is no reason that this patient has anything other than cap. It is most likely that he needs more time to recover response. Dropping the macrolide will be a mistake. Results were followed, urine no growth, blood culture coughed with negative streptococcus, which is a contamination. Sputum is elder streptococcus pneumonia, again fertilization. Urine was positive for legionella antigen. What is the most likely diagnosis? The diagnosis, the diagnosis is legionella pneumophila pneumonia, and the patient diagnosed as legionella of pneumonia and notified. Urine antigen test was positive for legionella hemophilia, hence the diagnosis because it has sensitive and specific to about 95%. Streptococcus pneumonia said before, from a sputum, contamination, Bresen's cons is the contamination. Now, what's the treatment for legionella pneumonia? It's oral leoflox for three weeks. The patient was started on leoflox for three weeks because leoflox has a good bioavailability. And, uh, and patient medical recovery. So that was about how to interpret the sensitive reports, how to and uh, how to see, uh, proceed with the investigations. The next thing is antibiogram. Antibiogram is, is like a, <clears throat> the profile of uh, is, is a profile of this resistance pattern, sensitive pattern of different organisms which are isolated from the hospital settings against different antibiotics. So this can be generated automated by softwares, or it can be generated by entering the data into softwares like WhoNet. And it can be generated manually too, but it should be generated at least annually for both IPD separate and IPD OPD separate and uh, separate for high risk areas. These antibiograms help us to understand the antibody, help us to formulate the antibiotic policy, and for, so which helps the clinician for the best empirical treatment. So this is how the antibiogram helps us. It helps us to understand the percentage sensitivity against different organisms against uh, across different areas. So it is imperative for every hospital or healthcare setting to have antibiogram and an antibiotic policy. This is the, the, the two pillars for the running the stewardship program in any hospital. In any case, the result of sensitive testing needs to be interpreted with some background knowledge of the biology of the organism, as said before. Do not use the antimicrobes if they are not necessary. Always take into account the intrinsic resistance of the organism. Patient history is important. Drug choice needs to take into account the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics. Always possible to use the narrow spectrum antibiotic and result the most important or result drug for the for result cases only. So that was about the sensitive testing. If you see the molecular diagnostics, like we have geno uh, genotyping methods like PCRs, the microarrays, MALDI-TOF, which help us to de rapid detection of the resistance mechanism. It provides the fast results. It helps us to the uh, help us to overcome the interpreted challenge. It, uh, say for OXA48, NDM, IMP, VIM. Based on the detection of this resistance gene, with the, the, the clinicians can take up for the uh, most rational antibiotic. That is about the molecular and the rapid diagnostic test. If you see biomarkers, the CRP and the procalcitonin are the most evaluated biomarker to diagnose bacterial infection. They did a good but imperfect diagnostic performance as an issue. A uh, good rule of test will be PCT values less than 0.1. It is a high negative relative value for exploiting bacterial infection. In pneumonia, if CRP is less than 10 and sepsis is less than 15, it can be used as an indicator of the antibiotic, but there is no such clear guidelines. So PCT and CRP can be are useful markers to discontinue the therapy. Uh, PCT non-clearance is a predictor of mortality in patients with sepsis. So that was a short about the PCT and CRP. Which, which, uh, CRP has a slow induction, low specificity. Uh, is, it is to monitor the course of infections. Uh, Procalcitonin is a rapid induction. It uh, peak levels roughly correlate with the severity. It's the precursor for uh, hormone calcium. Normal levels is about 0.1. If you see the PCT, uh, the role in antimicrobial stewardship, a value of less than 0.1 means the bacterial infection is very unlikely. No antimicrobials needed. But, uh, repeat can be done after 24 hours. If the PCT would have been more than 0.5, bacterial infection very likely. Yes, antimicrobials would be required and consider stopping the treatment.
तो डेड वैल्यू के हेल्प अस टू एस्केलेट और डीएस्केलेट द ट्रीटमेंट द अदर बायोमार्कर्स लाइक फॉर फंगल वी हैव गैरेटोमन एंड गिबिडी ग्लूकॉन गैरेटोमन हेल्प्स अस टू डिटेक्ट एस्पर्जिलस इंफेक्शन इट इज एफडी अप्रूव्ड ओनली इन सीरम एंड बाल दैट इज बायोकोले लवाज इट्स रूल्स इट्स अ रूल ऑफ टेस्ट एंड हाई हैज अ हाई नेगेटिव पोटेंशियल वैल्यू सो द डिफरेंस बिटवीन गैरेटोमन एंड गिबिडी ग्लूकॉन इज दैट the uh, beta glucan is for calcium and aspergillus gyrotomon for aspergillus and uh, won't go to won't go into the details uh, we share this slide uh, it's a, it's a good a good fungal biomarkers for gyrotomon and beta glucan so the take home message is that there can be infection without culture positivity culture positivity can happen without infection also in case of, of contamination of colonization so you need to differentiate between infection contamination and colonization never treat a lab report Treat only the objectively defined infection. Never treat a normal flora or colonization contamination. The take-home message will be choose the correct test, correct interpretation, rapid communication, and appropriate adjustment of the antibiotics based on diagnostic test. Point of care test or rapid test helps in the early identification and, and initiation of the therapy. But a negative POCT or rapid test does not mean absence of disease. Biomarkers are as good as a rule out test and has a high negative predictive value, but cannot guide the initiation of antibiotics. so that was all from my uh, one hour session i hope i have addressed the uh, expectation of the participant open for questions will i appreciate the questions to the chat box i am thankful to all the participants for a kind attention uh, i will I surely i will share the uh, presentation with all all the participants here uh, th thanks a lot <clears throat>